Welcome to Tea Time, my friends, a place where I muse about my gender transition experience and in the process aim to comfort and inspire others to a greater level of self-awareness. I am Artemis, enjoying a cup of Dark Cocoa Rose Petty Four, courtesy of the Rose and Vine Gift Company, and we're going to tackle a very large subject. Um, so I've, I've had this video script sitting in my digital notebook for quite some time now, and honestly, the longer it sat, the more notes I accumulated on it uh, from multiple different things all relating to the same subject. And that topic is pronouns. At first, it was just going to be about the origins of pronoun use, you know, some stuffy academic dissection of what pronouns were supposed to be versus what we're using them for today. And it has grown into this multi-headed hydra of a monster so intimidating that to try and weave seamlessly together that I decided to pull out one of the things that I actually find useful from my time in college, which is to use an outline method format. So my apologies to those who are listening. It may not seem as seamless as my usual method of communicating, but I will do my best to read through all of the outline headers so that you can follow. All right, so let's slay this beast. Starting with the pen is mightier than the sword and briefly exploring the origin of pronouns, beginning with the definition of the word. So according to the dictionary, pronoun, a noun, means word used instead of a noun to avoid repetition of it, it says circa mid 15th century from the old French word pronoun or pronom and directly from Latin pronomen, which means word standing in place of a noun. So from the word pro meaning in place of, and nomen meaning name. All right, so what's kind of funny to me here is that it seems as though pronouns were originally a way to just kind of spice up the language or even potentially condense syllables for efficiency or maybe even laziness instead of constantly referring to a name or a proper name. We generally think of pronouns as being he, she, or him, her, but this is for animate objects, and for inanimate objects, we have it as a pronoun. But today, we actually find it funny to refer to somebody by their name in repetition within a sentence, or to call something or ourselves even it, because now it sounds weird to us when there was a time when that was actually normal. As in, Artemis really hates it when Artemis has to get up extra early just to scrape ice off of Artemis's car in the winter to go to a job Artemis can't stand. So now, Artemis lives in Florida. Either way, I appreciate the efficiency of pronouns, and so saying a one-syllable word as opposed to a three-syllable word or name five times is appealing to me. The idea of gendering the pronouns is actually something that has vacillated between gender neutral and binary for several hundred years now. Without going into extreme detail, what I was able to uncover was that during the 12th and 13th centuries, masculine and feminine pronouns developed to a point where, according to the Old English Dictionary, they were almost or wholly indistinguishable in pronunciation, beginning as H-E, pronounced hey, H-E-O, hey-o, or H-I-T, hit. The H's slowly grew silent, rendering them as neutrals. The modern feminine she first appears in the mid-12th century, according to my research anyway, seemingly, at least, in part to fight for a distinguishing between the genders, rather than to continue to keep them ambiguous. Later down the line, in 1789, William H. Marshall recorded the existence of the singular OU, as in OU, will, which was an attempt to bring something gender neutral back onto the table. It expressed either he will, or she will, or it will. As you can see today, it didn't widely catch on. And as we'll see, it was our further development of a legal society that led us to revisit the idea of gendered language. So in 1886, a Maryland Supreme Court decision found that he, in a state statute covering admission to the bar referring only to males, precluded women from practicing law. 
So in 1916, self-avowed experts declared that the use of he in reference to a particular section of the U.S. Constitution barred women from serving in Congress. The argument didn't hold, and Jeanette Rankin became the first woman elected to the House as a representative of Montana, the state of Montana. It would appear that the fight for women's rights would continue to spur the need for general neutral pronouns. Interestingly, more as a way to ensure quality under the law rather than be sensitive to gender identities, which is more of what we're seeing today. On a personal opinion note, since it appears that we have received equal protection under the law for men and women, I believe the focus for pronouns has shifted to coddling people's sense of self because when not preoccupied with injustice or survival, many people cannot seem to be content with compromise and create their own self-interested psychosis just to keep things spicy. Anyway, we've had proposals of alternative pronouns before. Other touted ideas since the late 18th century have been he, er, his, er, him, er, him, er, self, thon, and zi, zim, zer, the good old standby today. The topic has been here for a few hundred years now, but nothing has taken root. So let's talk about the challenges of trying to integrate new pronouns and why those challenges are there. So the biological origins of pronouns and the inherent challenge of usurping them. We have to recognize that inherent in the discussion of pronouns is the underlying foundation of basis in the binary. As in, our pronouns are based on the understanding that we have two sexes of human, male and female. And oh load, don't ask me to talk about the non-binary here because I already did it, link above. When we are communicating, we are telling stories. Referring to someone by their sex can be a shorthand for giving a lot of contextual detail that is built into our understanding of human beings. In the concept of evolutionary biology, we have loads of built-in understanding of the general characteristics of men and women honed into our DNA for millions of years. And so, for the average situation using gendered pronouns, can fill in the spaces. Designating a pronoun for someone you do not know is a snap judgment based on those secondary sex characteristics that have been pretty consistent for millennia. Of course, you can run into trouble by then assuming certain stereotypes, but basic gendered language without deeper questioning is meant for quick, impersonal communication, which is the vast majority of our interactions, and therefore wouldn't even apply if you were having intimate conversation where details could be explored. So, in the majority of our wordy lives, there isn't another shorthand detail like binary gendered pronouns that hold as much weight in communication or are as efficient. And the use of them is not concerned with individual people's feelings about them. That being said, implementing a new system fraught with individual complexity makes quick communication harder because you'd constantly be making new pronouns, like the alphabet soup group is currently doing with sexuality. You can't get it right because you can never get it done. And the rules that end up sticking in society at large are based on what is most helpful for the majority and take a very long time to implement. In the case of pronouns, not based on the binary, you're fighting millions of years of evolutionary programming in humans that understands the world in relation to two sexes. And so each generation would have to pick up the torch to keep new pronouns in the culture because it's just not inherent in the biology. Hence why we haven't seen anything stick despite people throwing lots of darts at the board. Okay. So, how we're using alternative pronouns today. It seems to me that the reintroduction of novel pronouns today is in relation to a couple of things. This movement of fighting the confines of our binary understanding of the two human sexes, and this focus on the narcissistic need of forcing society to validate your individual sense of self. Now, I'm all for the amazing range of gender expression between the two points of masculine and feminine. But what I'm not here for is the creation of a pronoun for each expression because there would literally be no end to it. It's infinite. 
and we can find the appreciation in that complexity without forcing people to comply with your individual identity for the sake of your misplaced center of mental health. Pronouns are not for your feelings, as we discussed already. They're for ease of operation in society. And if we base things off of feelings, they'd be constantly shifting. And even if your gender identity is stable, it's not society's job to validate you. It's your job to validate you. Link above for that video. Now, certainly, we do get some societal feedback that is important to place ourselves on the map. Like, you know, Mowgli from the Jungle Book growing up around animals, then thinking that he's an animal. Or perhaps like those cute videos that you see of ducklings who imprint on human beings because a human in that instance was the first thing that they saw when they came out of the egg. But a self-responsible and stable person fills in the finer individual details without making it someone else's job. When someone tells another person what their preferred pronouns are right out of the gate, if this person isn't just following the newest trend, it indicates that they are keenly interested in controlling your perception and want a very specific image of themselves reflected back to them in order to validate their identity. This means that they don't give a rip how it makes you feel. They just want to use you to mirror what they want to see because they are terribly insecure and unable to stabilize their sense of self for themselves. It's important to note here that I'm not talking about the individuals who, when asked, will politely tell you what they would like. The person I am talking about is the teal-haired, bowl-cut, body modded TikTok trans who would righteously rant for minutes why you should use the novelly created Zimzer today and E.M. Ers the next to refer to them. And as a side note, I do kind of think it would be cool to come up with perhaps a single additional standardized pronoun that is alternative to the traditional binary. Maybe. But to anyone wishing to distinguish themselves in such a minority way, I would be very skeptical of their narcissistic snowflake status to begin with, at least at first. And again, the likelihood that this pronoun would stick around for more than a generation is slim. You know, it's a lot easier than trying to get institutional or even wide ranging societal acceptance of a whole new pronoun. Simply not allowing the pronoun to define you, using your actions in the world to do that job instead. Pronoun use as gatekeeping and a rite of passage for transgenderism. So this section definitely borders a little or a lot into my personal philosophies and subjective opinions on pronoun use, so take that as you will. All I aim to do is to get people thinking about the things they do and find sound reasoning in that, not to try to tell anyone what to do. And further, question what it means to be loving and respectful. Who decides what rights are and who is deserving? Because right now, our default seems to be that we deem preferred pronouns a right or a courtesy, that it's respectful and loving to use them without question. And I'm going to demonstrate why I don't always feel that this is subjectively true. We've been taught courtesy as a perverse workaround of our egos, as in it's courteous to give someone what they ask of you if the bar is low enough, but conveniently avoids inflaming people's sense of disrespect when disobeyed. So it's both a passive and pacifying behavior that prohibits awareness. I'm fully aware that my position is an unpopular one, and I'm not putting it out there as a superiority flex, nor do I think that my opinion is always the best one. This is more like playing devil's advocate where I have some skin in the game, trying to show a different angle that I genuinely find helpful so that all sides may be considered before making a decision. So, we've established objectively that pronouns are based on the binary male-female system, and each come loaded with millions of years of evolutionary biological understanding. 
And as far as my subjective opinion goes, each sex has earned their pronoun through the rites of passage of puberty and socialization of that sex. They've thoroughly lived those experiences and as such are called by that respective pronoun. A transgender person cannot ever fulfill those natural conditions, so they only get to be called by their chosen pronoun if two conditions are met. Again, this is my opinion. One, they can prove themselves respectful to others and have empathy for others' experience surrounding the issue rather than tyrannically demanding that others obey them. And two, they have lived the experience of their transition gender for a period of time with some form of medical intervention like hormones or surgery. Again, I realize that that argument is subjective. However, it seems to me that if someone is going to ask me to suspend reality, there had better be a congruous and well-founded reason for doing so, and not just because someone wants me to, for their comfort, with no effort on their part to actually live the experience. Sure, there is something to be said about giving people the benefit of the doubt and creating a friendly space. Just all too often, it seems to me that we do this in favor of talking around people's sensitivities, calling it a courtesy, instead of upholding objective truth. I get why this exists, I'm just saying that I feel it sucks. Interesting to note here, too, is that if anyone can just claim that they are a man or a woman, does that somehow invalidate the experience of a cisgendered person by the current radical ideologic? And if you want to run with the argument that it is disrespectful not to use preferred pronouns, is it not disrespectful to let someone who has not lived the experience of a cisgendered person appropriate that pronoun with nothing more than a, I feel this way, therefore I deserve it? Who decides what is disrespectful? Who decides that anyone is deserving? Their argument is just as subjective as mine. And in reducing manhood or womanhood to something that you just feel, does that not cheapen or make meaningless what it means to be part of that group? Because the very notion that something has boundaries is what distinguishes it from anything else. But this exclusionary nature seems to be what the narcissistic person who desperately wants access to will simultaneously denigrate and idolize. It's kind of twisted and pretty maddening. So the benefit of objecting to preferred pronouns. Another point surrounding pronouns was one that came up in my video about Elliot Page involving conjecture for why I chose to refrain from using her preferred pronouns. And in chipping away the crust of those objections, there was a diamond to behold. I talk at length about this in my video about gatekeeping and questioning the transgender community. I'll link that above. But I'll get into it a little bit here for its relevance to the preferred pronoun usage. <clears throat> I'll start by saying that I believe in the dual nature of a lot of things to balance out the whole. Light and dark, left and right, left brain, right brain, male, female, good, evil, etc. Where the right brain, politically left-wing individuals are often concerned with creativity, progress, innovation, and tolerance, the left brain, politically right-wing individuals are interested in security, stability, and tradition. You need both for a balanced society, and I believe that I offer the more left-brain, politically right-wing perspective, which is to question new ideas so as not to topple an existing functional system. I do not take anything at face value, and I definitely do not trust people to know themselves well enough to truly know what they want. Their decisions often made by feelings and flawed foundational beliefs. In refusing to use Elliot's preferred pronouns, at least at first, I am signaling that I have doubts and am giving that person a chance to self-reflect and make sure that what they're saying is really what's best for them. As humans, we use each other like mirrors, a way to see ourselves from the outside. But all too often, two things happen. One, we don't like what we see, so we attempt to force others, aka the mirror, to show us what we want. Mara, Mara. 
On the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? And we also assume that when we are questioned or disobeyed, that it's somehow a form of disrespect, a show of superiority on the part of that person. The <laughs> I get it. Questioning and willful disobedience have been weaponized in our society. Instead of using questions to be curious and show respect by being sure that you understand someone, questions and disobedience have often been used in an attempt to tear someone down and expose a weakness in order to win an encounter. And that's a really unfortunate thing because it prevents us from making social progress. It's a reoccurring theme in our mythological lore of familial structures, too. The biggest example being the son who grows up to challenge and usurp his father as a dominant male. It might sound cliche and ridiculous, but this is where our evolutionary biology programming to focus on competition and domination is operating on a subconscious level. And without our conscious self-awareness of how this permeates many aspects of our lives, we default to behaving in self-defensive and righteous ways. It doesn't pay to deny the primitive drives within. Denial just makes the baggage heavier. Accepting our nature and working with it is, as far as I can tell, the only way up. So, by holding a line and respectfully, initially, objecting to others' demands who have proven no grounds for heeding, it proves useful feedback to those who can surmount their self-defensive response, and also keeps chaos at bay. In the case of people who think they are transgender, the objection can come from a place of great care and concern, and may give them the pause needed to consider more cautiously and avoid the detransitioning phenomena that we see so prevalently. Respecting the objectioner's viewpoint, so long as it's done maturely, reflects a much more emotionally stable and secure mindset as well. Plus, you won't convince or change anyone's mind if you're defensive and disrespectful in return, attempting to force your will on them. To a final point here about the potential benefits of being cautious about preferred pronouns. And this is a dark one, my friends, I'm sorry. It's often argued that just acquiescing to what pronouns someone wants would improve their mental health such that it would prevent them from taking matters into their own hands and ceasing to exist. A euphemism I'm using to avoid the YouTube algorithm acts. To that, I have a couple things to say, at the risk of sounding clinical and cold. Claims of transgenderism have a high correlation with comorbidities of mental health issues. And that's an unfortunately real statistic. It would be impossible to tell if denial of pronoun use or those other mental health issues were the reason that someone chose to cease to exist. Even if we weren't psychological experts or psychologists, it would be a difficult call to make. You could argue, though, it still doesn't matter. Why not do what you could to save that person's life, even if it meant something as simple as using their pronoun? To which, here's my answer. What if that person was grasping at straws in an attempt to cure their mental anguish, and transgenderism was just what they happened to grab onto, but that wasn't the cure all along? What if by simply affirming their preferred pronouns and claims of being transgender, all we did was cover up what the real root of the problem was, potentially making it worse. And they never were able to question deeper because all anyone ever did was affirm something that, in time, they came to realize was just more of a mistake. And then they have the added burden of admitting that it was a mistake. And this is even the more benign form of using ceasing to exist as a reason to comply with someone. A common feature of borderline personality, histrionic, and narcissistic personality disorder is to use the threat of harming themselves to gain compliance in people around them. It's an emotional manipulation tactic. Now, of course, I'm not saying that all people are like this. 
They're just nuanced things to keep in mind in the broader picture of making informed decisions because it's very messy, very complicated, and I'll leave this hydra of a monster on this note. As long as you have given great thought to why you do what you do and you act consistently in good faith, that's the best you can do.